Hello, everyone. My name is Fiona Wang, and I'm a senior communication manager at the Unity Foundation. Thank you so much for joining our workshop. Today's topic is Mint and NFT. We have our speaker Severin Fett with us today. He's going to kick things off with the workshop, and I'll be monitoring the chat for questions. So, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the chat, and I will save the Q and A till the very end. So, the workshop is going to be recorded and it's going to be published on YouTube in the next few days. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Severin. Please feel to take. Uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And um, welcome to the workshop from my side. Um, I will be talking about NFTs. And to start off, I'd like to talk about what actually is an NFT. Because it's such a growing space with lots of people getting interested in it. I think it's worth reminding what we're actually talking about. So an NFT or non-fungible token is basically a digital equivalent of a collectible trading card or an art piece. So you probably know Pokemon cards or Yu-Gi-Oh or Magic the Gathering cards. It's just that, but in digital. But since we're talking about digital things, we don't only limit ourselves to pictures. Pictures are definitely the most common way to do NFTs, but it can be anything, be it a video, um, a secret key maybe, a piece of music, or a GIF, basically anything. NFTs are often organized in collections where there's a bunch of NFTs that um, are for a similar topic, I'm sure you've heard of the BTC flower. That's a bunch, I think about 200 different pictures of almost the same thing with small variations between them. I see punks has been a thing a while ago. There's a bunch more. The example I will be talking you through is also capable of making an entire collection, um, but you can also it, use it for just a single NFT. Now, why would you want to put an NFT on the internet computer? The first really, really big reason is the cost. If we talk about a simple picture that you could take on your phone, that's about three megabytes in size. If you want to put that on Ethereum, on the main chain, that would cost you about a million US dollars. And I don't know about you, but I don't have that amount of cash laying around just to upload a picture. On Solana, which is a bit more geared towards the kind of thing we'd like to do on the internet computer, it's still really expensive at about two and a half thousand US dollars, whereas on the internet computer storage is really cheap and you pay about 1.6 cents per year to keep your picture uh, hosted online. It's been quite a meme for a while uh, that people say about NFTs that it's just a link to a picture, but now on the internet computer, we can actually store the picture on chain and don't have to reference something else like IPFS or even a totally centralized server. The other really cool thing we have on the internet computer is flexibility. If you'd like to transfer an NFT, that costs basically nothing. Access control is really simple to do, which I'll show you in detail afterwards. And you can easily make more advanced models um, of access control, just like pay-per-view. Um, if you'd like to sell an online course, for example, or you can um, rent an NFT for a while, that's all really easy to do. Also, since we can store and serve the content from the chain itself, it's really easy to have an updatable NFT without 
really any extra work necessary. Now, working with NFT canisters um, is pretty straightforward, but there's a few things we have to talk about. Uh, the biggest thing that's currently not defined yet are standards. Standards describe how someone would work with an NFT, like if they want to transfer an NFT from Alice to Bob, which function would they call? Um, there's a bunch of standards out there at the moment. I listed uh, five of them that I found within about 10 minutes of searching. There's no one big standard yet on the internet computer. On Ethereum, there's the ERC721. For us, we don't have the one big standard yet. There's work ongoing for that. And if you'd like to get involved, please look at the developer forum. There's a working group talking about exactly that. At the time our example was written, uh, DIP721 in its first version uh, looked the most uh, useful and feature complete. It was a lot more cycles efficient than other standards that were available at the time. And since it's just a sample DAP, there's no need to pick a standard that's uh, um, used by a specific exchange. If you plan to list an NFT at an exchange, for example, make sure that you pick a standard uh, that is accepted by that exchange. Um, by the way, picking a standard is most of the time not excluding implementing any other standards. So it's easily possible to combine DIP721 with other NFT standards as long as they don't have any overlapping method names. Now I'd like to present you our sample NFT container. Um, you can find it in the Definity examples repo. If you go to the Rust uh, folder and in there you can find the DIP721 NFT container. In its readme, you can also find a link to the experimental minting tool, which I will be using uh, at the very end of the demo. I am now switching to the console. Uh, on the left, I have the console where I will be working. On the right, don't pay attention to that. That's just uh, where I have the commands uh, prepared so I can copy paste them because they're way too much to type while doing a live presentation. I'm starting DFX in a separate terminal so that everything's running there. And I'll start by deploying our NFT canister using this command. I'm sure you know DFX deploy by now. If you have a canister that takes some arguments in its init function, that's how you would do that. You have the argument and then you pass the argument as a candid encoded string. Uh, for our example, uh, the argument defines the name of our collection. We have a symbol, uh, which is basically the shorthand for the name, uh, a list of custodians, which we're not using at the moment, and the logo for the whole collection, which we're also skipping right here. Let's deploy it. And there we go, our canister is online. Now it's just a canister with no NFTs in there yet. So we will use the function mint dip721, which is the function defined by the dip721 standard that's supposed to be used to mine or to mint a new NFT. Um, I have set up my console so that um, the dollar $u gets expanded to the principle that we're using. I also have set up um, 
the dollar Alice and dollar Bob to expand to principles for two other um, identities. To mint our NFT, we say who will be the owner of that in the first argument. So we will assign it to ourselves at first. At the very end, you can see the content. So the NFT will be just the string hello. I'll show you later how you can do that with larger things and not just text. And then we have a bunch of data or metadata, for example, uh, the content type, which will be very useful if you want to serve our NFT over HTTP. And there's also the location type, which is sometimes used when serving things over HTTP. So let's mint our NFT. And we get back the OK, which means everything worked. Our NFT will be ID 0 with a token ID of 0 as well. If I just mint the same thing a second time, like this, now we get back the ID 1 for our second NFT. And I think the token ID is just a transaction counter um, to deduplicate uh, requests. So now let's see if everything worked all right. Um, to do that, I will call the get metadata function, which should return the, the metadata we set, as in the content type or the location type. And it will also contain the data itself for the ID zero. That's a query call. That's why that went so quickly. And you can see we get the data back just as we wished. Next up, we will check um, what's the owner of the NFT. That's a public function. So if you don't know who owns a certain NFT, you can ask like this. Again, we call the owner of DIP721 as defined in a standard for NFT number zero. And we get back this principle. And if we check, that matches the principle that we set it to. Now I would like to transfer that NFT to Alice. So we use the transfer from tip721 function with the first argument of who's the current owner, the second argument who will be the next owner, and then which NFT the command should concern. An update call takes a bit longer than the query call. But again, now we get transaction ID number two. Uh, since the previous transaction of minting our second NFT was transaction ID one. And if we now check uh, the owner, of NFT zero, we should get a different uh, principle. Before we had the B6 and now it's TX and just checking <coughs> that matches the Alice we set it to. Um, we have a bit more time. So um, one more function uh, of the DIP721 standard is how many uh, is uh, the balance of that returns how many NFTs a certain principal owns for the the whole collection present in that canister. So to check here, we see uh, this principle owns only one NFT at the moment since we transferred NFT zero to Alice. 
So there's only NFT number one uh, assigned to you. If we now transfer um, NFT one to Alice, then this should return zero, as you can see right here. Now, if we uh, look back to how we minted our NFT, we added our data at the end. Um, if we want to add a picture here, that's going to be pretty annoying in the command line. Uh, technically, it's possible, but then you would have to um, encode the bytes of the image in a string, and that is really annoying to do. So for that, we have created the experimental minting tool, which you can install like this. You will find that in that command in the readme um, of the NFT example canister. Um, I have it already installed, so you won't run that. But using that, you can really easily um, upload a picture as an NFT. You can just point it at a simple file. You say who the owner of the NFT should be. Right now, we're on the local machine and not on the real internet computer. And then you say which canister um, we actually want to target. And if we do that, we have minted NFT number two. And we can see how that looks. Um, so if we now fetch NFT with ID two, we get a picture in string form. Um, not the most attractive picture to look at like this, but again, you can see the NFT exists. Um, now I'm on the browser and you can see I'm on the internet computer. This is um, this very canister uploaded to the real IC with six NFTs minted. There's a function in there uh, that defines a minimal HTTP interface. And if we just uh, go to the um, index of the whole canister, it shows you how many NFTs are contained in it. Um, we are here on the ic0.app uh, domain and not raw.ic0.app, which means um, all our um, assets that are served and that we see are certified so we can trust it's the real thing. Um, working with that is a bit more complicated. I won't go into detail in this presentation with it, but if you have time at the end, I can show you a few things so you can figure it out on your own how to do it much more easily. Um, in the workshops three and four with Kyle Peacock, um, there's already a few of the basics about certification. I would recommend you start there. So our NFT canister um, can display our NFTs. Um, right now it's defined that if we type or go, go to the path zero, zero, we will get the first piece of data for the NFT zero. As you can see, NFT zero is this animated picture. Um, by console, it looks like this. And if we go to one, we get the, the second NFT, which is just a, a boring picture of a one because it's just an example canister.
now that you've seen how we can work with NFTs, I'd like to show you a bit more how it actually works in the canister itself. Right here, you can see how we store the state of our canister. We have a list or a vector of NFTs, and we have some uh, data about the NFT that we have, or about the canister that we set at the beginning, like the logo, which is uh, just null in our example on the command line. There's the cust custodian of our canister, which is basically the canister admin and the operators I will tell you about a bit later. The NFTs themselves, they all have exactly one owner and maybe one approved person. Um, an approved ID is someone who can act as if they were the owner for that specific NFT. Here is how we store the actual uh, picture or text or anything. You can see it's just a list of bytes. So you can really store arbitrary data in there. And the metadata, that's for example, the content type. You can also choose anything you'd like for that. Um, yeah, whatever makes sense for your application. Now I'm going back to the presentation to talk a little bit about access control and ownership, because that's something I think is really relevant to basically any canister you will write. You have to think about how should be able to access what. And um, different standards uh, within NFTs have different uh, principles or recommendations, how you allow people to access things but also different application demand, uh, different models of access. Uh, DIP721, for example, has the owner of an NFT. There's the approved user, which is just like the owner for one specific NFT. And there's operators where uh, the owner can delegate their authority over the whole collection to any number of other principles. It's basically like aliasing, um, but for identities. Um, having approved users or operators makes a lot of sense if you'd like to keep uh, certain private keys as secret as possible. If you have one key that controls all your assets, it may be useful to store those keys really, really securely. And then if you have one less secure key per asset that you own, if you get compromised on those keys, you don't lose all your assets. So think of what users may want to do or how users might want to secure their assets. Um, again, different standards have different ideas. EXT, for example, does not have approved users. They just have the, the operator and the owner. And our example as the custodian, the custodian is basically the admin over the whole collection and they can do anything or yeah, they act like the owner of every NFT and they can also change the metadata like the name of the collection or the logo of the connect collection. Um, since we have um, different concepts, or, yeah, depending on what the intention of one thing is, it makes sense to use a different data structure, which I've shown you over here. We said every NFT has one owner, so it makes sense to just use a principle. Every NFT can have an approved user, but doesn't have to. So it makes sense to use an option there. Um, operators and custodians can be any number of people, 
So there we use a list or a set, in this case, a hash set for both. Whenever you process a function call, you then have to make sure the people are actually authorized to do what they're trying to do. And on the right side, you can see a picture of how it's done in the code. Um, we always check, is it an owner? Is the, the person that calls the function approved? Or are they an operator for that NFT? Or are they the custodian? Um, I'll show you quickly how you can actually get the caller of a function. Um, In Rust, you use this function. I don't know by heart how you do it in Motoko, but it's just as simple there. Um, you can always get um, the, the principle of the person making the request using this function. You can straight up compare with that. No need to do any special comparisons. One more thing, there's two special principles that you have to keep in mind. Um, you may have encountered the management canister principle with the five A's followed by two A's. That is one reserved principle. You can construct it by um, just creating a principle from the empty list. I can show you. Um, right here in the code, um, let's see. Right here, you can see the management principle, you get it by creating a principle from the empty list. Or you can also construct it from the text of five A's followed by two A's. Um, this principle is um, a special one and nobody can be this principle but it can be entered as a valid one. So if we transfer our NFT to that principle, um, there's basically no owner anymore. In our example, we use that to intentionally burn NFTs. So if we would look at the burn NFT function, um, it would just set the owner to the management canister principle but it can also happen accidentally. So um, maybe you want to add some safeguards to your code that people don't accidentally destroy their NFTs. Um, the DIP721 standard actually has a transfer function and a safe transfer function. The only thing the safe transfer function does uh, in addition to the normal transfer function is that it checks if someone accidentally um, wants to transfer to the management canister. In that case, we just say, nope, don't do that. But otherwise we let the person do whatever they want to. The other identity that you should be aware of is the anonymous identity. The principle looks a bit more complicated but constructing it is almost as simple as the management canister. This time you just create it from the list with just the number four. Um, everyone can impersonate the anonymous identity. For example, if we go back to the console and list the identities that we have configured, everyone will see the anonymous identity. And if we do this, now any request we make will be with the anonymous identity. You can do that just as easily as I can. So if you want to do some kind of access control, uh, for example, for pay-per-view, uh, think of what happens if someone buys 
um, access using the anonymous identity. Since everyone can impersonate that, in principle, every person on the planet will be able to view um, your content using that identity. It can make sense to exclude this special principle um, from your approved or from the possible buyers. Um, now I've talked for a very long time, and I think now is a good time to answer some questions. Please type them in the chat, and Fiona will read yes. them out to me. Yes. As I don't but have yeah, we do have some space to read it myself. <laughs> We do have some questions. Okay, so let's from the start. The question, the first question asked is the new generation NFTs are upgradable and updatable. Can that be done on ICP2? Yeah, we uh, the internet computer can do basically anything you can do with a computer. So it's easy um, to change NFTs. Um, you're um, depending on what you want to do your buyers may not be very happy with it but it's definitely possible um, for example in our example we have um, the function set logo which is the logo for the whole collection which only the custodian can call um, but you can just as easily add a function to change a specific nft um, I don't know too many standards, but the ones I saw so far all don't allow changing um, your NFTs with a standardized function, but you can anything you'd like. Yeah, go for it and let me know how it works. Thank you. And the next question is how to collect fees of ICP coins when mint an NFT? So um, um, to collect fees when minting, um, you have to provide the minting as a service, which would mean that you create, um, um, so yeah, that would mean for your uh, mint function, um, In here, you would check that uh, the function call carries an amount of cycles or ICP. And if, if there's enough uh, attached, then you will mint it. And otherwise you would reject um, minting the NFT. Um, yeah, you would have to look at the Rust CDK docs or the Motoko, Motoko documentation how to accept um, fees, but you will just check within the minting function how to do that. Thank you. And the next question is many of the NFT projects are cross chain. Is it possible to mint cross chain compatible NFTs on ICP? Um, right now, it's not uh really simple yet um i know bitcoin integration will come soon so um i don't know how much you would like to mint on the bitcoin blockchain but that's certainly coming soon um i don't know what's the state of our http call um project but with that you could uh, execute arbitrary http calls using a bridge and the Ethereum integration is on the roadmap, um, which would make uh, calling Ethereum contracts pretty easy. So I'd say it's coming soon, but right now it's not really easily doable. And I'd say for a hackathon project, I would stay away from that for the moment. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dimas that he has checked the GitHub and he's asking NFT repo for Motoko is coming soon. May we know when it's available? Um, Jason, 
who is working on that um, said on Monday that he has just one or two more functions to go. Um, I'll ping him again afterwards. Um, yeah, I'll annoy him until it's live. And he asked, is that possible available before the Hexel started? Yeah, that should be easily doable. Thank you. So next question we have from Wahid is asking, what is the main method to focus on Hexel? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, well, thank you. So he's asking, what is the main method focus on Hexel? So yeah. You can also check the chat. I, I read really copy. Uh, copy I'll here. have to read it. Um, yeah, no worries. The, the areas of uh, yeah, the areas of Hexon focus. I think that a question is uh, not we're going to discuss in this workshop. So we would like to oh, encourage okay. you to ask questions more about um, NFT okay. that uh, Silvery can answer. Yeah. Um. But to answer it a little bit. Um, if you go to the Supernova uh, main page, you can see a list of categories for which uh, prizes will be awarded. I'm sure you can find a category which interests you. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, and for the Motoko example, I know the DIP721 repo has its own uh, reference implementation of DIP721. I think if you go there, you should find a Motoko example. Um, I think I even have the link for that open. I can paste that in the chat. Um, oh, nope, sorry. Their implementation is, is in Rust as well. Sorry about that. Um, I'll know um, in a bit more. Yeah, no worries. We have a question from Dustin, and Dustin asked that he read that Divinity is working on an NFT standard, and if there is a schedule for when this standard will be released. Uh, no release date yet, but if you go to forum.divinity.org, you should find the. Uh, Standardization working group. Um, can't find it right here, but you can see where the standardization working group um, works. I would start searching here. Okay. I think uh, that is the questions we have so far and you can continue to your sharing. Okay. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to tell you about access control and um, mostly NFTs. Um, I would like to expand a little bit on certification. Um, I will assume that you have seen the presentation by Carl Peacock, that would be workshop three and four. If not, feel free to go rewatch that on the Definity YouTube channel. Um, maybe it will make a bit more sense then. Um, I will just give you some pointers so that you can understand the certification implementation. Uh, in the example here, I can't talk you through every single detail. So we have this query function in our canister. This is, uh, I would treat it as a reserved function called HTTP request. Um, this function is called if you want to call a canister through the ic0.app domain or yeah, domain. It expects that you have a header set called IC certificate with the content of the certificate and a tree that proves that your response actually is certified. 
Um, to create such a certificate, you have to set the certified data in uh, during an update call. So when we mint an NFT, for example, we will uh, save our data, um, add it to the certificate or to the certified data, and then store um, or store that data. Afterwards, if we get a query call over HTTP, then we can load that certificate and prove that our response actually is correct. Um, the certified data is very limited. Um, it has only a couple bytes of capacity. Um, I think 32 bytes at the moment. So we have to do a little bit of trickery um, to prove um, or to certify more data. We do that by using a hash tree. A hash tree is a data structure that can contain a lot of data along or in a normal tree structure. But the whole thing can be summarized into one small hash of those 32 bytes. If we then uh, certify just the hash, that means uh, we certified all the content of the whole tree. And if you were to change even just one small thing in that tree, the whole hash changes. And you can see that it's not certified anymore. Um, the way those certificates are expected to work is that you have the path up here uh, of our request match the path in the tree. So you would save the hash of this image you see here in the, the hash tree at the path one and zero. This is what happens in the add hash function. You can see um, this is where it would be inserted in the tree. Then once we want to um, return or create our certificate right here, or yeah, the certificate header, we would first simply fetch the certified data. And then we add a tree that proves that our data is actually certified. Um, for that, we don't have to transmit our whole tree. We just have to transmit enough parts of the tree that people can actually verify that the tree is correct. The witness function minimizes the tree exactly in such a way that it still can be verified. Um, once you know what the witness function does, it's actually not too bad to read. Here you can see the witness tree is actually created and then it's just transformed into um, the expected format. I would recommend you just take one example. Another way to go about it is to read the whole interface specification, but that's going to be a lot more difficult to actually do. Um, the rest of this gigantic function here is really just URL parsing so that you actually return the data you want to. So the whole translation of slash one slash zero to actually the correct location in the tree, a bit of error handling, nothing too crazy. Now that I've explained um, the high level view of the certificates, I would recommend we have a bit of time for questions. So if anything of that made somewhat sense and you need something clarified, please ask now.
I don't really see any questions in chat yet, but uh, if you guys have any questions, take this opportunity and feel free to ask Severin. And if you have any questions not specific to certification, don't worry. Um, I am at the end of what I have prepared. Um, we can do some general Q&A as well. And otherwise, if there are no questions in a minute or two, I think we can also close the session. Yeah, okay. So uh, we just give you guys uh, extra four minutes. And if there is no extra questions, that will be the end of today's uh, workshop. So um, let's just give it a couple minutes for you guys to raise your questions. A question for a uh, question to Siri on Mint and NFT. Anything about today's session, about today's workshop? Feel free to ask him. Uh, we have a question Q and A. When will this video be uploaded? Um, oh yeah. I think it goes pretty quickly online, probably two days, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah couple couple of days. I will answer this question by, by typing as well. Yeah, and also you can raise your hand to ask questions. Okay, so what he asked, anytime we will have a DFX in Windows? Um, really good question. We just uh, fantasized about that yesterday <laughs> in our team. Um, not anytime very soon, but we're thinking about it. But I can tell you that if you use uh, the WSL2, the Windows subsystem for Linux, you can already run DFX on Windows. I know it's not as convenient as you'd like it to, but we have it on our long-term roadmap to make it easier. Wow, that's cool. Thank you. So two more minutes. And if you guys have questions, please raise your hand or type your questions in the uh, chat room. Okay, 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 thank you. Uh, the next question I think is more to uh, me. So next uh, next session is about uh, build and DeFi. So basically every, the same time next week that we'll be talking about build a DeFi. And then the one is uh, build a DAO, the, the, the one after next week. So stay tuned. And just a reminder that all our workshops will be put uh, in our uh, YouTube channel. So just make sure that you also check our video, uh, YouTube channel to learn more, to learn, to learn more, learn more and again. So I think that's it. Thank you so much for all your time today. And thank you so much, uh, Severin. And hope you guys have a nice, beautiful rest of the day. Bye.